Hi, I'm Dr. Kishishin, and welcome to our podcast series, PPE, Podcast for Psychoeducation During the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm joined by Dr. Karen Fontiel from the Department of Palliative Medicine at LACUSC. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to discuss a few different topics, but specifically about end-of-life care and how patients and families are being impacted during the pandemic, dying with dignity, um, which is now more important than ever, and what can we do to help loved ones facing such a difficult situation. So Dr. Funsale, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I am a county born and bred physician. I Uh, all the way back from medical school in Chicago, um, all the way up through my emergency medicine training, um, which is my primary board, I have trained at county institutions. And so um, no matter what I do, I keep coming, (laughs) I keep coming back to the county. I came to palliative care from a pretty non-traditional route through emergency medicine. Um, And a lot of people ask me, aha, those those things feel like opposites. Like how did you get to palliative medicine from emergency medicine? Um, I do still practice emergency medicine. I still do a shift a month at um, LACUSC's uh, medical center's emergency room. Um, And I feel very privileged to do that. It's an amazing place to work. Um, But actually to me, they seem like uh, two sides of the same coin. Uh, Mm -hmm. Palliative medicine is about minimizing suffering wherever you can and trying to maximize living wherever you can. You know, nobody has a ton of control over the dying, but you have a ton of control over the living and what that looks like. And palliative care and ER cares about that stuff. Um, I, I knew for a long time while I was practicing emergency medicine primarily that I had this huge knowledge gap that people were dying in my emergency room all the time or were coming to me with diseases that meant they were gonna die very soon. And I was sort of microscopically focused on some lab that I was trying to correct or trying to manage their pain for a little bit or, you know, trying to give them a few more minutes or a few more days. But like at no point was I focused on what those days or minutes was gonna feel like like whether it was really gonna be living in a way that these people really meant when they said, I wanna live for longer. Um, and I got more and more and more uncomfortable with what I was doing. Like, I can, but should I? Was what I kept thinking as I intubated another patient, as I put another central line in in somebody who didn't look like they were gonna benefit from it or appreciate it for very long. And um, I went, uh, I sort of had a little crisis about what being a doctor meant and I needed a break. And I thought maybe the problem was the way we practice medicine in America. So I did a locum tenens in Australia and I did uh, six months in an outback ER where the resources were very scarce and where they were very carefully managed. And part of who did the managing of those resources was palliative care because I've never met them. I didn't know what they did. But what I noticed is that they were having conversations with families Um, on the worst day of their lives and saying what sounded like sort of awful things like it's time grandma's had enough and these families were not losing their minds they were appreciating these conversations and I kept thinking who are these people how are they getting to say how are they getting to say this stuff and like nobody falls apart and calls a lawyer (laughs) I must find out who you are and so I did and when I came home from my local tenants I did a palliative care fellowship Wow. And, and I, I won't say defected. I didn't defect from emergency medicine to palliative care. And for a long time, I did both like pretty regularly. Um, but for the most part, I, um, I really just, uh, I, and I didn't think I was going to be this person, but I really liked the developing of the relationships. And it seemed to me like a pretty noble practice of medicine. Like if you can take animal panic of what's coming next and the fear and the sorrow and you can make it manageable and you can turn what's going to be a terrible experience into a manageable, beautiful experience. Like what else would we have put on earth to do? Like that seems like the highest practice of of medicine. And so is this depressing? No. Is it sad? 
sometimes, but I get as much satisfaction out of doing this work as I do when I crack a chest or tube someone or, you know, shock someone back to life. It's amazing. Wow, well, I, I have no words. That's, um, thank you for everything that you do. Uh, you know, for, for, I guess the listeners who have heard the terms palliative medicine, palliative care, and I think you did a really good job of describing it. Can you explain what your colleagues, you and your department, what's your day-to-day -day life like? And, and can you explain how the role of hospice comes into play as well? Sure. So, I mean, the sort of elevator pitch that I give people when they're like, oh, okay, what's that? Which is 90% of my day is, Look, palliative care does a couple of things. We see most of the very, very sick people in this hospital. Um, and we are experts in symptom management. So if you're, you or your loved one has got a lot of pain or shortness of breath or nausea or vomiting as a result of their bad disease or the treatment of that disease, like people turn to us as the experts of getting that under control. So that's one of the things that we do. And that's whether you're dying of a disease or not. So that can be the day you get diagnosed of your disease or like at the very end of many years of treatment. Um, the second thing we do is look, anytime you get diagnosed with a really serious illness, it always comes with really complex information and complex decisions. Mm -hmm. Most people would appreciate a little help navigating that stuff. Um, and sometimes the teams need a little help navigating that stuff. Um, we're the team that helps with that stuff. So we help patients and teams and families sort through all the difficult information. We help them try to decide what they want to prioritize out of these treatments and try to make sure that their treatments match their priorities. That's fundamentally what palliative care does. Sometimes when um, the priority is I want to make every day as good as it can be, I want to stay out of the hospital and spend what time I have with my family and I want to be as comfortable as I can be, Hospice is the best way to do that. And so hospice is a subset of palliative medicine reserved for people who we think have six months or less and whose treatment goals are, I want every day to be as good as it can be and I want it to be with my family as much as it can be and not in the hospital. For those people, hospice is the, is the kind of palliative care and the service that we provide to make that happen. Wow, thank you for your explanation. It sounds like you are with patients and families during very difficult decision-making time. How do you think that your practice and your field of medicine has changed since the pandemic? I'm trying to remember what's still the same. <laughs> <laughs> what has not changed because of the pandemic? The providers have a renewed appreciation for their own mortality and a deep, profound sense of gratitude for how lucky they are. Like, provi healthcare providers have difficult lives and um, it's easy to re be reminded of the sort of ordinary and frustrating obstacles that are put in our, in our way every day when we try to do the best by our patients. Um, and, I, and I would say that we're a gritty but complaining lot sometimes. <laughs> the pandemic makes me realize how petty some of those things are and how, how incredibly lucky and privileged we are to do the work that we do, to be healthy if we're healthy, to have our work families who are tr truly extraordinary and our home families if we have those. Um, so I'd say the biggest gift the pandemic has given me is perspective. Because every time I say I am tired, I am sick, I am mad, I am sore, I am frustrated, I am baffled by the government, I see what a family or a patient is going through and I say this is small cheese. <laughs> every aspect of operations has changed. I, you know, from the clothing that I wear I now wear scrubs all the time to the masks that I wear, even in my own office, to the cracked skin on my hands from constant sanitizing, to you know how I document, to how I communicate with my patients, to how families see each other through glass, to um, whether they get to see each other at all. 
to the words that I pick. Everything has been changed by the pandemic. You touched upon a lot of different things, specifically, and we've, we've talked about families a lot. How do you think families are able to stay connected during this time, especially if they're trying to say goodbye to each other? Um, what, what have you seen? I've seen heroic efforts on the parts of providers to try to make this happen. Everything from sneaking in people up back stairs to using their personal devices to, to get FaceTime and Zoom connections because we don't have access to better equipment to get it done. Or that equipment is being used for other families. So there's just a shortage of it. If we were not able to use FaceTime or Zoom, none of these families would be talking to each other. For a, for a desperate family member to see somebody that they love, even in that, even in even in two dimensions. It is obviously not a substitute, but it it really, really matters. Um, and the small show of I get what this means to you. I will make the effort. I will walk into a COVID room with this phone. Um, the small gesture of humanity goes an enormous way to signal to a family that that there's common there's common ground here. That I that I will risk walking into this infectious hotspot because I know that you cannot live if you do not see your loved one's face. Like what else communicates I care? It, it matters more than the drug or the clinical trial or the vent settings or how long you will keep them vented or any family meeting. This thing that says, I get it, I will walk into the room with my phone and show you his face is irreplaceable. Right. I can imagine that, especially during this time and in your field, that communication with not only the patients, but their families is really the most important thing. Um, do you think that you are able to have that same relationship or maintain that same level of connection now? Yeah, actually. Um, and this has actually been echoed by my colleagues across the country who have been surprised by the level of intimacy that they're able to maintain. Um, you know, there's something about catastrophe that I, I think strengthens bonds and makes you reach even when the tools aren't perfect. Um, the, my colleagues, everywhere have been able to describe intensely personal, effective, touching conversations, either by phone or video phone, with families who forgive almost anything because they, they're reasonable, they understand what the obstacles are, they're not expecting the moon, um, and who can feel your empathy and your, your sort of vicarious desperation on their behalf. I think, um, the conversations have also gotten necessarily more emotional because you've, you it's not as though we're immune from that emotion ourselves. Um, and so the conversations have even gotten a little bit less robotic and more and have been infused with more emotional language in a way that I think is even more effective when we're trying to convey the seriousness of something um, almost inadvertently, you know, mm -hmm. I think in a non pandemic situation, we have a remove that's been that's been eroded by the common stresses that we all feel. And that makes a lot of sense. We keep talking about the pandemic and coronavirus, but there are a lot of patients and families that are making end of life decisions that are, you know, for medical reasons other than the coronavirus. How do you think the pandemic has affected the, that patient population and their families? Has it, or has it at all? I do think it has. Um, you know, for many patients, for instance, living with terminal cancer, you know, in the, in, in, in the small hours, they anticipate that they will die. And they play it over. They imagine scenarios, but they didn't imagine this one, right? And their families have, in the small hours, in those quiet times dreaded this moment too, but they didn't imagine this. They didn't factor in all the things that they imagined. They didn't imagine that I might leave you in the ER and not say goodbye, right? right. So even the most prepared families sometimes were not prepared to deal with this like death in isolation, death suddenly, death painfully, death, death in lots of other ways, but not death alone. They didn't anticipate that. Um, and there's something diminishing about not dying of COVID, 
somehow. Like it's a less dramatic, less worthy, less sensational death. You know, the ah oh, that you get when you hear that somebody has died of COVID is different from the, oh, he finally died of his cancer in the age of COVID where everybody's so preoccupied by their own misery that it's hard to put aside, you know, death from something else. It's, uh, it's almost as though your compassion bucket runs out if it's from something other than COVID. But we haven't, even though there's, there's sort of COVID fatigue, um, we, we seem to sort of muster an extra, or at least my experience has been that people seem to muster extra compassion for that in a way that they, they just don't, it's, it's run out a little bit for other things. It's too much. So how, so, do you, yeah, so how do you think families are coping with that? How, how are, how, how I mean, they're especially angry when they find that, you know, their non-COVID infected loved one is dying in the hospital and they, their visitation is restricted, right? So you find yourself in these awful conversations in which you're like, yes, I know your loved one isn't infected and I know that you are not infected, but I still can't let you be with them. Um, and, you know, oh, well, we're gonna send them to a nursing home and I don't know that the visiting restrictions will be any less there. I have no guarantee. No, I have no information, right? And so it's like this, this double extra unfair whammy of like, I'm being treated like an Ebola victim and I, it's not like I have Ebola. Like, isn't this bad enough? Can't you, can't you do something? And it's always, and the answer is always the same. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I could. And they do feel as though their grief is extra minimized. Um, and it's hard not, it's, I mean, what could you say that would convince them otherwise, right? I haven't figured out a good way around this, other than to acknowledge that their deaths feel less, Im that I could see why your, your loved one's death would feel less important than a death from COVID that's getting all the attention. That's very difficult. I can imagine that's a very difficult conversation to have. Right. All you can do is be humble and acknowledge that it's happening, that that feeling is not unfounded. Right. What about, you know, end of life arrangements? We're hearing people having funerals via Zoom and what have you. How, how has that, have patients talked to you about this? Have families asked you about this? Families are absolutely robbed of an essential developmental stage when they cannot grieve collectively and in the way that they were accustomed to and need to, um, and which is rarely alone. <laughs> that is not I know of no, I know of no culture in which isolation is a necessary ingredient to positive coping. And, but this is now enforced. And the anger that lingers as a result and the crisis of faith that this can often engender is hard to manage. So some of the things that I've seen around Zoom tributes were possible because they were on Zoom, right? And are sometimes even lasting because there's a recording of this in a way that they might not have been had this been an in-person gathering. So some, so some people find a silver lining out of this, find opportunities to find meaning out of these things. Um, and I don't know whether the circumstances stoke resilience or whether these were people who are resilient to begin with people have asked how do you break bad news and sometimes the question is how do you break bad news to a age appropriate audience or whoever is the listener or the receiver of the news right you have to make it specific to that group or that individual do you have any tips on how you go about doing that well, the part that's universal is carefully, respectfully, and slowly, and plainly, mm. without euphemism, right? Um, now, the words that you choose and the detail that you use is, is of course, age, cultural, and sort of situationally tailored. Mm -hmm. um, in general, 
thank goodness, way smarter people than me um, have figured out a protocol that works for like 99% of situations in which you try to figure out what they already know and what they want to know. Um, be respectful of what they tell you they want to know and what they don't want to know. Like that is not a rhetorical question when you ask them. Um, you give them a warning shot that you have something serious to share with them so that they have sort of a mental opportunity to brace. You give them the headline, which is generally a not compound sentence that really just sort of is the bottom line of the thing you're trying to tell them. Um, and it should be free. Uh, it should not pull a punch. It should, it should really just deliver the news. Then you stop talking and you see what happens next. If the thing has landed, there should be emotional processing. And then you should attend to that emotion. If you attend to that emotion properly, they may be able to move on to what's next, the decision-making part. Many people don't, and they need time to process that emotion before they can move back to more information processing. And you have to pay careful attention to the signaling that they give you about whether they are giving you, I'm still in emotion land and I can't talk more about this, in which case you're respectful and supportive and the conversation is over, or whether they say, got it, I'm ready to talk about next steps, in which case you let them drive how many next steps they can still talk about. But we talk about this as a conversational map, which even novice communicators can learn how to do. Um, and when you become more comfortable, you can improvise around those steps. But that's how we teach um, learners how to do it. Thank you, that's very helpful. Do you, have families ever asked you how to break news to, for example, children? All the time. So there's a general recognition that at some point we have to tell the kid and please don't make me tell the kid. Please, please don't make me be the one who tells the kid. Or I really know, I wanna be the one who tells the kid but I don't have the words help me. And so we try to figure out which one of these things they want. We offer to be the one who tells the child with the parent in a support position or the family member in a support position. Um, and we um, were lucky on our team at least to have a social worker who used to work for Trinity Kids Care, the, ch the best children's hospice in LA. Um, and where she routinely had to talk about both to sick children and tell them what their problem was, um, or to help parents tell kids what's going on with a sick sibling or um, so on and so forth. And so I learned a lot from her about what each sort of age developmental stage can manage, how they process things like death at what age group, um, how to avoid euphemism without being scary, um, and how to interpret what you see next, because what kids do with their emotions can be really, really hard to interpret. Right. So we, I wish I had more expertise in doing this, but, I, um, but that's the beauty of working on an interdisciplinary team. I don't have to be an expert in everything. I have amazing chaplains and social workers and nursing specialists who helped me be more than like an army of one. Do you have any tips for the listeners who may have to have difficult conversations with their children? Yes, I would say that if I had one take home point is, I swear they know already. And they will, and if you give them the room, they will come up with a worse interpretation than the truth. Mm. So they can almost always pick up from the ambient emotion and the whispered conversations that something is deeply wrong, they tend to default to it must have been my fault because when information is hidden from them, they think they are responsible for something. Um, and depending on their age, their magical thinking um, can be not productive coping. So 
Um, if you think you are doing them a favor by hiding painful information, the vast majority of the time you are not. You are contributing to coping that is going to be very hard to undo later. So what I can reassure listeners out there is that there is a calm, kind, healthy, manageable um, way of sharing almost any piece of news. You do not have to figure this out on your own and that there are professionals at schools, at healthcare facilities, at mental health facilities um, that can help you figure this out you, like, and ask for that help. Your kids will thank you later. Thank you for saying that. Absolutely. We definitely want to promote this. Please reach out to your healthcare team and that we are here to help in any way possible. Absolutely. Um, you know, with all the information that you've given us and the experiences that you've had, um, is there a takeaway or anything positive, any special moments you can talk about? It is important to view this as a gift. There are definitely days in which I say, on December the 31st, I'm performing an exorcism <laughs> to get rid of this year. Yeah. I, I, am, I am definitely going to perform some pagan ritual to <laughs> cleanse myself of this awful, awful year. But I have never been so acutely aware of my, of how deeply, deeply grateful I am for my colleagues, for my health, for my family, for the opportunity that I have had to spread my luck around, to help the people that I have, to, to, to just sit with people that I haven't been able to help. Um, and I have to believe that despite all the frustrations that I see, you know, for every person I see not wearing a mask, I see somebody leaning down and helping out and reaching, reaching out to, to a stranger to be helpful. It is easy to be focused on the things that are going wrong and Lord knows there are many things, but I, I am so surprised to see how many things are going well, how many, how many people are stretching to help fellow humans. It's not something we see very often and sometimes we see less of, particularly in these really divisive times. It really is a time of community and togetherness and we all need one another, especially now more than ever. Well, thank you for your wisdom and thank you for your thoughts. It's been a real pleasure. And um, thank you again for all the work that you do. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.